So for those of you who weren't here in the last talk, um, I'm Drew Gallatin. I've been a FreeBSD committer since the 90s. I really, really like fast stuff and making things go fast. So the first thing I worked on in FreeBSD was the FreeBSD ports of the Deck Alpha with Doug Rabson. And I kicked around doing stupid stuff in the network stack. And now I'm really lucky because I work for Netflix and I get to play with really fast machines that serve real traffic to real people on the real internet. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about uh, well, what I'm calling NUMA siloing in the FreeBSD network stack. And well, really, really what this is is to serve 200 gigabits a second of uh, TLS to Netflix customers from a single machine, using FreeBSD, of course. So why do we want to serve this much traffic? Basically, since uh, 2016, we've been serving uh, at roughly 100 gigabits a second with uh, with kernel TLS uh, from you know, a single, uh, what we call a flash appliance. And we want to continue to, to drive our costs down and to consolidate things and reduce density, so we want to try to do 200 gigabits a second from a single box. So in order to explain why this is a challenge, I need to first talk a little bit about our, our workload. Um, so we use FreeBSD Current, and we're basically, we're basically a web server. We use the Nginx web server. And we serve all of our video via send file and kernel TLS. And like, like if you were here in the last talk, uh, you know, we enable kernel TLS now with this TCP, uh, TLX, TS, ah, TX TLS enable. Try to say that five times fast. So why do we need 200 gigabits a second? Uh, why do we need NUMA for 200 gigabits a second? And in fact, what is NUMA? I'll, I'll explain NUMA in a little bit. But first, let me talk about why about where we are with 100 and what, where we need to be for 200. So for 100, we started off with a Broadwell Xeon for our original 100G in 2015, uh, 2016 or so. And that has about 60 gigabytes a second, or about 400 gigabits a second of memory bandwidth, and about 40 lanes of PCI Express. And now we've moved on to newer Intel generations, Skylake and Cascade Lake, which have 90 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth which, if you noticed, isn't quite, two, isn't quite 800 gigabits. And they have a little bit more PCIe Gen 3, but not, you know, not enough. Um, and so the, this, may, this diagram will seem a little bit familiar if you were here for the last talk. And if I can figure this laser pointer out, I'll try to annotate it. Um, well, I have my own laser pointer. At least I did. Uh, so basically, uh, the, the workflow for kernel TLS, as I, as I mentioned before, is send file will uh, pull data in from the disks into memory, and then to encrypt it, you've got to read it into the CPU, and then to read it, and then to, once you've encrypted it, you've got to write it back to memory, and then once it's been written to memory, the network interface card needs to read it to send it. And so if you add all these, if you add all these 25s up, it's pretty easy math, you get, you get to 100 gigabytes a second of memory bandwidth is what you need. And from the last, from the last slide, you could see that the ZN only had 90 gigabytes a second. Um, so how do, we get to, how, do we get that, uh, how do we get that much memory bandwidth? Well, the simplest thing to do is just throw another CPU socket at it. So basically, you, know, it's, it, you double everything. You've got twice as much memory bandwidth, twice as many PCIe lanes. And you've got two uh, UPI links, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into more detail about that later, connecting the two sockets. And uh, you know, on, this, on these prototype machines, we have um, eight uh, really fast NVMe drives, and we have two 100 gig NICs. And we thought, well, why not give AMD a chance? So let's build a prototype around AMD. And when we first started this, uh, we were looking at the AMD uh, Naples uh, series machines with um, the interesting thing is here is that, we, is that you can do this in a single socket with AMD. Um, and just like, the, just like the, uh, the Intel, we have eight NVMe drives. But the, on the AMD, we actually have four NICs. And I'll get into why in a, a little bit later in the presentation. But we're not running 400 gigabits. We're running you know, four times 50, basically. So, you know, once we doubled everything, we we're like, yeah, we're going to get a lot of performance boost. But actually, the performance went down. Um, so, you know, our normal workflow, our normal workload was we were getting about 85 gigs on AMD and about 130 gigs on Intel at 80% CPU, and crazy stuff was happening. Uh, you know, we get crazy disk latency spikes that would 
uh, drive our NGINX uh, latency way up, which would cause clients to run away in terror. And, uh, and I should mention, by the way, that in case it wasn't clear before, all the testing I do is with real Netflix, uh, well, I mean, not the, not the very beginning testing, but the, the, most of the real testing I do is with real Netflix clients. So if you live in San Jose uh, or if you live in Chicago, um, you've, prob you've probably uh, been served a video from, from one of my machines, and I apologize. Um, <laughs> So anyway, with, with no optimization, Numa is, just, was a, just was a non-starter. We, th you, you, we threw more hardware at it, and we got either negative results or not enough positive results to matter. So we didn't consider do, doing Numa for a long time because of earlier results that were very similar to these that we did in 2014 or 2000, 2015. So now we've got to understand the problem. What's, what's Numa? What does this Numa stuff mean? Basically, it means non-uniform. Uh, memory architecture or memory access, depending on who you talk to. So basically, it means that stuff can be closer to one CPU than another. Like back in the good old days, like you know, 15 years ago, before AMD did hypertransport and before Intel did, did QPI, basically the way a multi-socket system looked was kind of like this. You've got you know, the central I.O. hub or North Ridge or whatever you want to call it sitting in the middle. All the CPUs plug in equally, all the memory plugs in equally, all the disks plug in equally, all the network cards plug in equally. Everybody has equal access to everything. It doesn't matter if you're on, if, why can't I figure this out? There we go. If you're on um, this CPU and you want to talk to this disk, hey, great, go for it. If you, want, if you want to go to store it in that memory, yeah, it doesn't really matter. The problem is that these were slow and expensive and complicated to build. And so CPU manufacturers figured out that it was better to basically sort of build a network on the, on the motherboard. And you wind up with something that looks kind of like this where basically you have what's essentially two separate, uh, two separate systems that are tied together by this thing we call a NUMA bus. And what that really means is that stuff on the left side is basically his own computer, and stuff on the right side is his own computer. And these red circles, we call them a locality, uh, call these locality zones a NUMA domain or a NUMA node. And so what that really means is that if, if you are on this CPU, and you want to read something from this disk, it's got to go across and ideally into your own memory. Or, and if you're on the CPU and you want to um, access this memory, it's got to go across this NUMA bus. Or if, you're on, if you want to send something on this network card and it's stored in this memory, it's got to go across this NUMA bus. And the problem is there's only so much bandwidth on this NUMA bus. And once you get into AMD, you get into something that looks even weirder. And this is why we've got four network cards on AMD. So we can have one, each one of these red circles. But basically with AMD, you have, um, you know, NUMA links between the, uh, the, different, the, the four different NUMA nodes on a chip. And you've got four NUMA nodes, which is kind of a disaster, which is why the AMD performance actually went down so much compared to the Intel. So there's a, there's a latency penalty to go across these links. It's, uh, you know, from everything I've read and what I've seen, it's you know, depending on manufacturer and revisions and stuff, it's about 50 nanoseconds, give or take, give or take 50 nanoseconds. Um, the real problem is when you're sending a lot of bulk data across these links, 50 nanoseconds can turn into 500 nanoseconds, can turn into, you know, even milliseconds in some cases, which is really, really bad if what you're trying to do is read, uh, you know, kernel text that's on the other domain, or if you're trying to write to, you know, a, a, a global variable, if you're trying to read a VM page and you've got to, grow, go, and you've got to wait for some bulk data transfer to pass, that's really, really bad, and the CPU utilization goes crazy. So, um, and, the, and the bandwidth, speaking of bulk data, is, you know, roughly, from what I've read, in, and they try to obscure these things by talking about gigatransfers per fortnight or something, um, which, makes it really, which makes it really, really hard to, to figure out what you, what you actually get in bandwidth. But from what I've been able to figure out, it's about 20 gigabytes a second per uh, UPI link, or about 40 gigabytes a second per Infinity Fabric link. And the AMD is even more complicated because it depends on the memory speed and on the new ones, there's, multipl there's multiplying factors and it's kind of crazy. So anyway, um, what I came up with was after playing around with uh, lots of little optimizations to do things like move the VM page array to make the VM page array be backed by local memory on each domain, I decided, well, I'm just kind of playing with the small stuff and what I really need to do is figure out a way to organize things and keep the bulk data off the NUMA links because the bulk data, like I was saying, will congest the NUMA link and will slow down anything that you haven't managed to, to localize. So 
I'm going to go through uh, basically the worst case if you do everything you possibly can wrong um, on a, on a two-node machine. So basically, what, you, what happens here is you, this, this CPU, he wants to read... Uh, damn it. This, this CPU, he wants to, uh, to read memory from this disk and set, encrypt it and send it out the network. So he starts reading, he starts reading from the disk. Whoops. But whoops, it goes across the NUMA link and into the other node's memory because he wasn't paying attention when he allocated his memory. Um, and then he wants to encrypt it. So he's going to have to read it back across the NUMA bus. And whoops, he forgot to allocate it on the right node again. So he's going to write it back into the, he's going to write it back into the wrong <laughs> node's memory. And then he wants to send it out in the network. And you know, maybe he should be using this network card up there. But whoops, he's going to send it out this, this other network card. So, we end up crossing the, the NUMA bus four times, and you end up burning basically 100 gigabytes a second of bandwidth. So at this point, the fabric is going to saturate, and you'll have CPU stalls, you'll have latency spikes, you'll have all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so the best case is basically the case that I showed you kind of at the beginning, where you read from, you read from the disk and into, into close memory, the CPU reads, re reads it from the close memory, encrypts it, writes it into close memory, and then sends it out, out, out the, the network card that's closest to him. And that's beautiful. There's no NUMA crossings. This is how you know, AMD and Intel would really like you to use these machines in an ideal world. So how can we get as close as we can to this best case? Basically, all well, the simplest idea, well, let's just forget about, let's just pretend it's two machines. Let's have one, v, let's have one VM per, per NUMA node and pass everything through, except if you do that, you're going to double your IPv4 address space, and every IPv4 address is precious. And so at Netflix, um, when you get, a, when you get a, a movie or a video or a TV show or whatever, you press play, and your client talks to uh, Netflix stuff running in the Amazon cloud, and that stuff in the Amazon cloud figures out where the, where the, where, which, which machine has the file you want and if it's close, which is closest to you and which is next closest to you and next closest to you and so on and gives you a list of URLs where you can find that, that file. Um, so if we double the number of machines, then we're kind of doubling the work that we have to do in AWS. In fact, if we're running VMs, we're kind of more than doubling it because now you've got the hypervisor to manage too. So it's kind of a non-starter for that reason. And the next idea, well, what if we used multiple IP addresses? Oh, wait a second, multiple IP addresses? We don't want to do that. So for the same reason as before, basically. So basically, how can we get as close to the best case as possible while using lag uh, and LACP to, to combine the NICs and just to, to just use one IP address and while keeping the, the catalog the same so that you know, AWS doesn't have to do any extra work? So we need to somehow impose order on this chaos. And the first idea I came up with, which was not the winner, uh, was what I call disk-centric uh, siloing, which is basically try to do everything you can on the Newman node where the content actually lives. Um, and the other idea I came up with was network-centric siloing, which was try to do everything local to the network card that the connection came in on. And it, if you don't know anything about LACP, basically what you need to know is that when you're speaking LACP, um, your, your switch or router that you're talking to will take a connection and will hash it based on, um, the, the, based on, on some end tuple, and it will decide which of the lag ports that you're connected to that it will, the, the traffic will go over. So you have no control over that. So basically, we try to, in, in the network aware uh, the network-centric siloing, we try to do as much work as we can on the NUMA node that came, that where, the, where the LACP partner decided that the connection was going to live. So let's talk about the thing that didn't work first. Um, so basically, the idea was to associate a disk controller or an NVMe, uh, uh, really an NVMe drive, with a NUMA node, and then to basically propagate the NUMA affinity through the VFS layer until we got to a point where if we looked at a file, if we looked at a vNode, we'd know what NUMA node it was associated with. And again, but again, we have to do all the work to associate uh, network connections with NUMA nodes. And the idea is we want to move the network connection to be as close to the, to the, to the content as we can, so that if it, if it comes in on one lag port, it'll end up going out on the other. 
Um, so after we move everything, there's going to be zero NUMA crossings for bulk data. The problems with this was that, like, like I said, there's no way to tell the LAC partner, uh, you know, I don't want it to come in this node, I want it to come in this node. You can't do that. So basically, um, while you're setting up the connection, while you're doing the get, you're going to have your act, and before you, before you know what content you're talking, talking about, your acts are going to be going, and your rep replies are going to be going out one port, then as soon as you figure it out, it's going to be going out the other port. So you're going to have stuff going out both ports, and with TCP, that can lead to reordering, and that's kind of bad news, and I think Randall would be upset if I did that. Um, so the other problem is that, um, unbeknownst to me, clients will actually reuse the connection and make multiple, make multiple requests on the same connection. For those of you that uh, love or hate the newish feature where if you're on the Netflix homepage, just crap starts playing all the time, um, that, that it, it'll reuse connections for all that junk that's, 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 that's playing all the time. And so you'll end up having stuff coming from all the, from all the NUMA nodes on the same connection. So I was seeing connections being moved around willy-nilly and TCP retransmits going crazy and decided it was a bad idea. So I went back to the other idea, which was the network-centric siloing, which is basically, it's basically just dumb plumbing, and that's good because I'm just a plumber. Um, so es essentially, you have to associate the network connections with the NUMA nodes, and you have to allocate local memory to, to, back, to back the media files, and you allocate local memory for crypto, and you run the TCP pacers and on, the local, on the local node, and you ch manage to choose a, a, a local node to, to, send the, uh, to send the data on. So how do we do all this? Um, to associate the network connections with the NUMA nodes, basically, I'm gonna go through some kind of nitty gritty details of what's been committed and what's in review and all that kind of stuff. So if you're not a developer, you may wanna check your phone. Um, so basically, uh, I added a uh, NUMA node to a NUMA domain node to uh, the struct mbuff. There was just a, a tiny little bit of room, and I stole it. Um, and that was added a few months ago. Um, and I also added a NUMA domain to the ifnet struct um, also a few months ago. And this is kind of all groundwork, so try to stay awake. Um, basically, and and once I, once I did this, when a driver um, received a, a packet, he can tag that packet as he receives it with his NUMA node. Uh, and that's in, the, that's in the tree too. And I also added a NUMA domain to the INPCB struct, which is also in the tree. And basically, the idea is that when a TCP connection connection's bor is born in, in, syn in, syncache ex in the syncache expansion, um, you've got um, a NUMA node there in the mbuff that caused the, 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 that causes the connection to get established. And you can then propagate it into the INPCB table. And so the next, the next trick is to make sure that uh, you give that connection to the right Nginx worker, and I'll detail that in a little bit. So the other, and the other trick is what I thought was going to be a hard job, which is to allocate local memory for the... Uh, for send file to back the video files. And I actually came up with this gigantic patch to uh, plumb, uh, you know, all the way from, from send file down into, down into the VM page allocation routines, uh, a NUMA node. And uh, it turns out that I don't need any of that stuff. Basically, if you have a first touch policy and Nginx is bound to the, the right domain, then everything just works automatically. And I want to thank, uh, Alan Cox and Constantine for pointing out my stupidity and uh, <laughs> making me realize that the VM system already did everything I needed it to do. <laughs> so that was two weeks of my life I'll never get back. Um, so um, the other trick is to allocate uh, local memory uh, for, for, the, for the TLS buffers. So basically, uh, we, ru we run the TLS worker threads. I mentioned in the last presentation, we basically have a, a, a thread pool of uh, per CPU TLS workers. And the idea is that normally uh, connections are just hashed to them using, using just software, ha using something software hashing on the, on the n-tuple so that the same connection goes through the same uh, you know, TLS worker. But what I did was add a filter based on NUMA domain in front of that so that um, 
connections that were associated with node zero will go to a worker that's run, will be hashed to a worker that's running on the CPU on, on node zero and node, same, similar with node one. So, and I, I also set the, um, the KTLS workers to have a, uh, a domain allocation policy so that uh, they'll allocate stuff local to their domain. So that way, we'll, we're, we're doing the crypto on the same domain the, the connection lives on, and we're doing the crypto into and out of uh, local memory. And this, the KTLS stuff is in review currently. So how do we choose the right uh, lag port to go out of? So like I said earlier, uh, MBUFs are tagged, can be tagged with the Neumann domain. So when we go through IP output or IP6 output, uh, we, we tag the outgoing MBUFs. And I've organized, uh, I've, I've done a patch to lag, which is in the tree, which is enabled if you have uh, the used NUMA uh, option set for lag, where basically you've got this, you, similar to KT lash, you've got this hierarchy, rather than just hashing directly to, to any lag port in the system, first you, you filter by NUMA domain, and then you only choose a lag port in that dom that's connected to a NIC in that domain. And obviously, if there's no NIC in that domain, it'll fall back to just hashing to anything so that you can still send even if there's, even if that lag port's down. And that's in the tree. Um, so how do you choose the right Nginx worker? This, is, this was the hard part for me. So right now we've got this Esther reuse port stuff that uh, came in, I don't know, about a year ago or so, where essentially what that means is that um, you can have multiple uh, threads, multiple processes share the same listen socket. And again, it's kind of like lag, things are hashed uh, fairly, Connection, new connections are hashed fairly to these listen sockets, and that allows you to have you know, a bunch of NGX workers all listening on port 80 and port 443. And so, what, so the, the, the obvious thing to do is, uh, and everything's obvious in hindsight, the obvious thing to do is to uh, filter that by NUMA domain so that uh, you end up with, um, you end up with, uh, you know, you've, you end up with a, a new socket option, unfortunately, because of the way NGINX works. Um, and I can go into the detail for any, if, well, I'm a little bit sure, why not, why not? Um, so the way NGINX works is the master process start, starts up, creates all the list and sockets, and then forks up as children. And it, at least, you know, for a mere mortal reading the NGINX source code, there's no way to tell which list and socket's gonna go to which child to which domain. So the easiest thing for me to do was to uh, make a new socket option, which was called after the child had, inher had, had inherited his listen socket and sort of taken possession of it, and after he bound himself to, uh, to, to, uh, to a CPU. Then I, I can call a socket option where the kernel says, ah, you're running on this uh, CPU, which is on this domain, and you, wanna, you, and you want your listen socket filtered there. So that basically builds up uh, another one of these hierarchical models where first you filter per NUMA domain into a listen socket, and then um, uh, you hash among all the different uh, workers that are, that are listening on that domain. And like lag, there's a fallback, whereas if, if there's nobody on that domain, it'll go back to hashing among all the listen sockets on that port globally. And that's uh, also in review. And so, in, let's go back to that same diagram where I talk about the, uh, you know, the, the worst case. So in this model, the worst case is basically if you, always if you always get unlucky and your content is always on the wrong domain. So you know, going back to what we talked about before, we're running on the bottom NUMA, on the bottom NUMA, NUMA domain, on the bottom CPU, and we want to, we, and so a request comes in and we're reading, we're reading data from this disk on the top. So we go for one NUMA bus crossing, read it into local memory, and then, we, and then we read it out of local memory, and yay, we're encrypting it on the, right, uh, on the right CPU. And now we're writing it back to a crypto buffer that we were smart enough to allocate in the right CPU. And now we are gonna send it on, on the local NIC because the connection came in on this, on this bottom domain originally. So now in the worst case, uh, we've got one uh, NUMA domain crossing. And so basically, you're doing 100% of the, of, the, of the disk reads, the NVMe uh, reads across NUMA, which is about 25 gigabytes a second on the fabric, which is uh, much less than 40 gigabytes a sec second of the, of the fabric bandwidth. But the, the nice thing is the average case which is, is, is better. The average case is about a half a NUMA crossing because you're, you're, gonna get, you're gonna get it right about half the time and you're gonna get unlucky about half the time. 
So it's about 50% across the fabric. And that's about 12 and a half gigabytes of data on the, on the fabric. And uh, the nice thing is, on, in this case, the CPU doesn't saturate, and we had 190 gigs. Um, so for the four node, it's the average case is a little bit worse because you've only got a 25% chance of getting lucky. Um, so 75% is across NUMA, and you get a little bit higher bandwidth going across the NUMA bus, but that's still less than the 40 gigabytes a second, and we can still get better than 190 gigs. So here's what everybody's here to see. Um, one thing I should mention before I go into the performance results, this is sort of a game of uh, moving goalposts. Um, when I first started looking into this, we were looking at, the, at the, uh, the, the Naples, the first version of AMD, and we were looking at the, uh, the Sky Lake uh, Intel. And since then, um, you know, both of these motherboards have had their CPUs swapped to the, to the latest and greatest from the different manufacturers. So those first initial results were from FreeBSD from like, you know, fall of 2018-ish with uh, the older CPUs. These new results are from uh, just, you know, last week with uh, a AMD Rome, um, Rome uh, CPU and an Intel Cascade Lake CPU. So, and, and, and this is why the Xeon performance is lower. Um, that's something that I don't quite understand. Um, the way I got these numbers was to basically go through and intentionally torpedo all the, optimi all the optimizations I've done. And when I did that, I was surprised a little bit by the fact that it's 105 rather than 130. Um, and I think some of that is some of the work that uh, Mark uh, and um, Jeff have done to make, things, to make things better for NUMA, where I guess if you make things if you make things better, you kind of make things worse, if it makes any sense. There's some stuff in UMA that, uh, that we have turned on at Netflix, which will try to um, sort, basically it will try to, if you do a UMA allocation of like an MBUF or something on one domain, and you do a free on the other domain, it will try to return the, the memory to the proper domain rather than mixing up the UMA zone so that, so that you can still have a nice NUMA, uh, Zone, but the problem is that once you've, once you have uh, freed a lot of stuff on the wrong domain, that option gets really expensive because you're taking a lock and you're moving things back to the proper domain. And then, and when you're doing things right, it's awesome. And, and you're not when you're doing things right and you're not doing a lot of cross-domain freeze, it's it's great. But when you're doing a lot of cross-domain freeze, it's expensive. And so, basically. Um, I've actually measured with the Intel PCM tools, the, 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 the QPI utilization. It, they give you this, this metric that tells you how much of the memory controller accesses were remote versus local, and it goes from 40% to 13%. And on Epic, uh, because of four nodes, things are even worse, uh, so that you, you go for even better, I guess you'd say. Uh, so you go from 68 gigs to 194 gigs. Um, and for people who like visual representations, this is the, uh, the Xeon before and after. So roughly 100 to roughly 200. And, the, and the, this is the, uh, the utilization on the, uh, on, the, on the QPI bus, again, going from about 40% to about 13%. And here's uh, the bandwidth on the, on the AMD, going from 60-ish uh, you know, gigs to 195 gigs. And for people who like green screens with raw data, um, this is the output from uh, PCM.x showing the memory controller traffic. Uh, as, I was, as I was mentioning, this is the UPI data traffic memory control over, over memory, memory controller traffic, which is 0.4, and that's, that's bad. Um, and this, for people who aren't familiar with this, um, I wrote it, so it's my favorite tool. Um, it's something call, I call NSTAT, which is a, I got sick of having a window for VMSTAT and a window for, for NETSTAT, and either running NETSTAT with a, with a, uh, with a delay of eight seconds or doing the conversion in my head to convert from, from, the, from bytes to bits. So I wrote a tool that, uh, that does, uh, it spits out all the stuff I care about. So it's my tool, I can do what I want. It's in ports though, so any, anybody can use it. But, um, <laughs> 
Basically, it, it's, this is the output gigabits per second, the important fields here, the uh, number of TCP connections, the percent CPU, and things like system calls, and how many interrupts and context switches, and how much memory is free in the machine, and input and output in million, millions of packets a second. So that's, this, is the, uh, this is, of course, the before, and this is the after. You can see the 13% uh, remote, and that's a, that's a good number. And you can see uh, the 190-ish, 191 gigs with 150,000 TCP connections and, and the 70-ish percent CPU with, uh, you know, 100,000 context switches a second. Thank you, TCP pacing. And, um, and for people who like uh, looking at internal Netflix metrics, this is our internal uh, bandwidth uh, graphs showing each, showing each uh, link separately, sta stacking to about 100, 190 when the machine's finished ramping up. And here's the same stuff from the AMD. And I've crossed out the, the model because it's not a released model. Um, it's a roughly equivalent to the, the model number I said at the beginning of the presentation, except it has a lower clock speed. So the actual AMD results would be better than this because the actual AMD the real AMD CPU that's like this would be higher clocked. So this may be doing AMD a slight disservice by mentioning this, but I would, I would imagine this CPU number would probably be maybe 8 or 10% lower on the, on the real AMD part. And again, here's since uh, and the, uh, the big frustration with AMD is that they don't export enough counters for us to be able to measure the fabric utilization. And we've, we've complained about it to them. And I've heard the Linux folks are also complaining because Linux doesn't have it either. So if you happen to have a good relationship with AMD, complain about it too, please. Um, anyway, so here is the, uh, the data from the, the green screen data showing you know, 194 uh, gigabits a second when it's getting close to ramping up. And this is not nearly as pretty because we're not used to, we're, the way these things are numbered, they were numbered there were two port NICs, so they were numbered, uh, you know, 0, 2, 4, and 6, and no other machine has that many NICs, so it doesn't feel, it doesn't fit, and nobody's ever picked a color for it, but this, uh, this bar is the, you know, roughly 200 gig, 200 gig line, and it goes up to 400 because there's, because there's four 100 gig links active in the lag, but it's not really going to go up to 400 because some of them are Gen, gen 3 by 8 links. Um, so... That's it. I've rambled on for a long time about something really simple. So if anybody has any questions, this, is, this would be the time. Amazon uh, virtual machines. Why are you doing this? Because you have a lot of data box, you have a cost with these ones. What would be the cost to install some, uh, some machines for management in different parts of the world? Why are you using the Amazon services? It's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> did you have to implement any kind of rebalancing between NUMA domains, or did it work just? In, in terms of... of like you're worried about like, you know, uh, like a million connections on one domain and no connections on the other or? Just exhausting resources in one domain, maybe? The, we deal in, you know, orders of thousands or tens of thousands of connections, hundreds of thousands of connections. And it, it, on, on that level, it's, rough, it's, it's, gonna, it's roughly going to be fair because lag is going to be, you know, uh, hashing to the different NICs in a, in a fair way. Obviously, if one link goes down, then you're going to lose half your bandwidth, but you've still got enough capacity in that, in that Newman node where the link is up that you're going to be fine. Does that kind of answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Because I, I think it would be a different story if, uh, if A, you were CPU constrained because you were doing a lot of work that wasn't... Um, basically, if, if a connection was doing more work than you anticipated, I guess, I guess would be the way, the way to say it. Right, if one connection could somehow, or a small number of connections could somehow cause an inordinate number, amount of CPU use. But that's not something that can really happen. <laughs>
on the AMD, you've got four NICs, so you have a theoretical bandwidth of 400. Um, well, 300 actually. Well, because it, it, it's the it's it's a it's a uh, an older motherboard, so it's only PCI Gen Gen 3, so they're not they're not hooked up uh, with full bandwidth. Hmm. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask, is there is there a theoretical reason why like you got close but not over the 200 uh, limit? Uh, actually, I mean in when I was testing earlier, uh, if, I, if I let that guy ramp up, um, I think I could get it, I, well, I think, I know I, I got over 200. The problem is that when you do that, if you have, if, if lag is hashing everything fairly, which, which it is, then you are screwing over the people that come in on the, on the, on the links that are limited to 50 gigs because they're going to be bandwidth constrained and TCP is going to be, you know, going to be sort of seeing congestion because it, the NIC is going to be dropping packets on the way out. Hey, Kirk. So you probably answered this in your previous talk, which I didn't hear, but <laughs> uh, what percentage of them are going out with TLS? Uh, 100%. All of them. All of them. So for capacity planning purposes, we, we have to, for, for capacity planning purposes and for my performance work, we do everything with 100% TLS. Six sixty-ish percent on AMD and seventy-ish on Intel. Your earlier systems were at nearly one hundred, you know, ninety something percent. We, that's come down um, over the years. Uh, the the CPU use now for one hundred percent TLS, thanks to a lot of the work that's been done uh, in the VM system by Jeff and Mark and Constantine, is down uh, in the up, upper fifties. And that you see. The Broadwell machines that I was talking about earlier, the, they're so close to the memory bandwidth limit, limit that, the, that the performance, it's, it's like, kind of like a hockey stick, where as the memory bandwidth, it, this is the memory bandwidth on this axis, and uh, on this axis, and then the CPU use is like this. As you get, like, the limit, the hard limit is like 60 gigabytes a second, but as you get much over, the further over 50 you get, the some more you start to climb up on this hockey stick, and the, the any little thing, like every cache line, uh, on those machines, like any cache line is sacred. Um, so, so basically, any cache miss you can, you, you can avoid, you, you, you move further and further down that, that hockey stick and you, you, you save an inordinate amount of CPU. Like you could eliminate, I mean, I, there was an early optimization I did where I eliminated, uh, you know, looking at the third line, the cache line of an MBuff, which saved like 2 or 3% CPU on those machines. The same optimization on, you know, a, a Cascade Lake would probably save almost nothing because it's got excess, excess bandwidth. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So many years ago, Adrian Chatter uh, toyed around with similar things where he, where a sim single listen call would return 16 sockets the, on the per CPU PCPs. And then he added like a call where the worker could get a socket and query on which CPU PCB this socket was and then find the worker there. Okay. Would, would a, an approach like that help you for the engine X matching of the worker threads? It might. I would, this, would, would this was part of his RSS work? I think, but it never made the tree, I think because of UDP ref, uh, fragment assembly problems. I, maybe we can talk afterward because yeah. I'm not familiar with that piece of it. I think with that approach, though, what you would find is, if, I'll get true describe the problem of your bouncing the connections around, then you start bouncing your worker threads around to kind of bounce it wherever you got some listen this time yeah. or some accept this time. And so I think the strategy of instead of bouncing the threads around the input line, figuring out which threads in the input line are already down in the right place is probably the one that's going to perform better. Going once, going twice. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.